brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Habibi ilahi al-alameen abil qasim al-mustafa Muhammad. وعلى هبيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عمرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هذه أمتكم أمة واحدة وأنا ربكم فاعبدون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Living in the United States compared to living in other parts of the world has many benefits and advantages. For instance, there are many values which are held high in American society and culture. Values that allow the individual and society to prosper and to succeed. For example, we have the issue of the rule of law. Here in society, regardless of your background, regardless of who you are, what kind of socioeconomic background you have or status you have, everyone is subject to the law. No one is above the law. There are places in the world where based on how much money you have, or what kind of social or political position or status you have, you're not always subject to the law. There are differing levels of whether you're even subject to the law or you're above the law. We live in a society where everyone is subject to the law. We have issues such as freedoms, such as the freedom of religion and freedom of expression. Values which allow us, people of faith, to choose and adopt any faith, any religion that we choose to, or even lack thereof, without anyone intervening, without anyone telling you otherwise. We have many different opportunities for material success that are not necessarily around in other parts of the world. Yes, you know, even with the poor economic situation that we live in in recent years, but slowly, at least in some parts of the country, there's some improvement. I've been reading reports that tell of modest but steady advances or enhancements in, in the economy. Of course, it's different in different parts of the country, but there's some sort of revival. So there are many different values, many different norms that we have here in society that we can cherish and we can ad take advantage of that are not necessarily found in other parts of the world. No one can stop you. No one can tell you otherwise. It's up to you as an individual you're completely free to do basically whatever you want, of course, within the law. Now, you might say, say, you know, what's, what's wrong with that? 
There is nothing wrong with that in itself. It's a good thing to allow individuals to pursue their own objectives, to pursue their own desires and their own needs. However, the problem is when this concept is taken to the extreme. When it's taken to the extreme, individuals are encouraged to go after their own objectives, their own individualistic objectives, at the expense of their morality and at the expense of society sometimes. Let's look at an example. If we look at one of the loudest messages of American culture, we notice that society encourages us to go after instant self-gratification, to please ourselves, entertainment, fun, things which make us happy instantly. We are encouraged by society to go after things which give us instant self-gratification, to, to immerse ourselves in bubbles of pleasure, of individual pleasure. If we look as an example at the entertainment industry, the entertainment industry in the United States through its various manifestations, through TV, through music, through movies. We notice that Hollywood, for instance, a couple of years ago, in 2010, Hollywood made a profit of $11 billion in movie ticket sales. Not in people buying or renting DVDs or watching them online, or no. Only in the number of tickets that were sold where people went to the movie theater and saw a movie on the big screen, Hollywood made a profit of $11 billion. Now, billion, you know, so, sometimes, especially nowadays, with the deficit well above a trillion dollars, billion doesn't seem like it's a lot. Billion seems like an insignificant number. So let's try to visualize what this number is. A billion dollars, if you want to count a billion dollars, and you're counting a dollar a second, it'll take you about 32 years to count one billion dollars. Since it's the holiday season, just, you know, Christmas was right around the corner, uh, Jesus, was walking on the face of this planet a billion minutes ago. A billion minutes ago, Isa salam was walking around. This is one billion. Hollywood made 11 billion dollars just in movie ticket sales in 2010. Through its various, through, you know, uh, through the big screen, through movie sales. If we look at other parts or other aspects of the entertainment industry. Look at stars, actors, actresses, musicians, uh, you know, sports athletes and stars. They're envied in their lifestyles, in everything they do. We look at movie stars, we look at actors and actresses, and we envy them, where we admire their lifestyles. You can ask people about their family members, what their, you know, the names of their paternal or maternal uncles or aunts are, or their, you know, great grandparents, or sometimes even their grandparents, ask them what the name of their grandmother or grandfather is, and they won't be able to tell you. But if you ask them about the Kardashians, they can give you their entire family tree with all of the details. We envy them, we look up to them. Oh, this person did this, this star did this. This person traveled here, this person bought this item, this person was wearing this dress, and so on and so forth. And it's unfortunate. We look up to them as role models, as people who we'd like to emulate in their lifestyle. Sometimes people go to the extreme where they're proud to purchase certain memorabilia. You know, items that belong to famous people. I read an article in Times Magazine, or Time Magazine once, about some of the most expensive items that were sold, that were auctioned, 
that used to belong to celebrities and famous people. Alarming numbers. I'll give you a few examples. One is a dress that belonged to Marilyn Monroe. And she wore this dress on uh, President Kennedy's, one of President Kennedy's birthdays. And while she wore this dress, dress to the birthday party, she sang happy birthday to the president. And that's it. She never wore this dress again, of course. She only wore it for that one time. This dress was sold at an auction for how much? For $1.2 million. A dress that was worn by Marilyn Monroe in which she sang happy birthday to President Kennedy. Mark McGuire, the famous baseball player, his 70th home run baseball in 1998 when he broke the record for the most home runs in one season, his 70th home run baseball was sold for $3 million. Pablo Picasso, one of his paintings was sold in an auction for $106.5 million in a record eight minutes. People were racing with one another to buy a, a painting because it had Pablo Picasso's name on it. Now, you know, these, some of these might be extremes, and of course there are exceptions to this rule. Not every American, you know, adopts these values where they're thinking solely about themselves, about instant self-gratification, they're immersed in, in pleasure, and so on and so forth. But if we look at society, society encourages this kind of lifestyle. It pushes us through its various means and mediums to adopt such a lifestyle. One of the biggest challenges that Muslims face in the West is that we try to fit in, we try to integrate within society. We try to fit in. Now, in doing so, we adopt some of the good and noble values of society, and that's excellent. Again, I mentioned some as an example. Some of the noble values, some of the, the good values. In adopting those, there's no issue. But sometimes, in, in fitting in, in trying to integrate and assimilate, we embrace society and in all of its values and the entire country, uh, culture, we embrace it wholeheartedly. So not only do we take in the good values, but sometimes we also adopt some of the negative values. If we look at our understanding of love, what does it mean? Now, I don't intend on getting philosophical on what love is and the types of love and the meaning of love, no. But in general, if we look at the example of love, we notice that our understanding of love is correlated, again, to the concept of fun and entertainment and enjoyment. If something is fun, I'll probably love that thing. If that thing is not fun, if it's not, you know, if it doesn't have any a pleasurable benefit for me, I probably won't love that thing. Now, when it comes to material things, that's fine, no problem. The issue is when this kind of thinking, this kind of mode, this mentality, it moves away, it extends not only from the material, but from the non to the non-material also. When it extends to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance. Why is it that so many people feel like they're completely bored when they pray. They're bored. We have to pray, pray five times a day. And some of us, sometimes we feel like we're bored. That one of the most boring things to do is to stand up and to pray. I'd rather be doing anything else. You know? I'd rather be doing anything else than standing and praying because it's boring. Because it's not fun. Because there's no excitement in praying, because it's this kind of mentality that I have. That in order for me to enjoy praying, in order for me to enjoy strengthening my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to be fun. I have to get something immediate out of it. There has to be something pleasurable about it. Otherwise, there's no, there's no reason for me to love this. There's no reason for me to enjoy this. Versus the inherent significance of having a strong relationship with Allah. 
Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, Ilahi ma'abadtu ka khawfan min narik, wa la tama'an fi jannatik. I don't worship you, my Lord, out of fear of punishment, because if I don't, then you're going to throw me in hell. Or out of hope for paradise, because you've promised those who obey you that you're going to give them, you know, castles and rivers and gardens and everything. He says, وَلَكِنْ وَجَدْتُكَ أَهْلًا لِلْعِبَادَةِ فَعَبَدْتُكَ I found you suitable, worthy of worship. And this is why I worship. Because you're, you're worthy of worship. Because you are the one and true God. Because you are the most merciful. Because you are the most compassionate. Because you are the creator. Because you are the one who has given me everything and anything. Because you're suitable for worship. And the same goes when this kind of thinking extends to our relationship with others, not just with Allah, but with the creation around us. Our concern for others sometimes is based on whether or not we benefit ourselves. And we find this in, a case, in the case of many charities as an example, right? We notice that many charities, a lot of charities nowadays Nowadays, you know, the objective of, of the charity is to extend helping, a helping hand to help others, right? We're raising money for a certain cause. Many people or some people, they end up, the only way that you can encourage them to help others is by inviting them to a charity event in which there are entertainers. In which there's, you know, there's either a band that's playing or, you know, a comedian that's up there or there's, you know, a carnival, or, or there's something where they can benefit. And it's really sad, brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not critical of the whole concept of charities and having, you know, entertainment in them. But unfortunately, sometimes in order for us to be pushed, in order to help others, we have to be able to benefit ourselves. This is a kind of thinking that many people have adopted. That before I can reach my hand into my pocket and write a check for the orphans or for the victims of this earthquake or this, you know, natural disaster or this, you know, uh, disease or what have you, whatever it may be, that I have to be able to attend this event. I have to, you know, I have to be able to laugh. I have to have satisfaction. I have to have a good meal. And then I'm ready to donate to this whatever cause. Because we're thinking about that, because we are connecting our relationship with others, our concern for others with the issue of entertainment, with the issue of individual pleasure and entertainment. This is in the case of, you know, entertainment. We also look at the case of technology. Now technology you know, we live in an age where there are technological advancements not only here in the United States, but in many different parts of the world. But if we look at technology here, we notice that it's on a different level. Our attraction and our connection to technology. If we look at social networking as an example, and more specifically, as an example, Within social networking, let's just take the example of Facebook, because it's probably the most prominent and the most popular of uh, social networking sites, over a billion users worldwide. The issue of Facebook, if we look at the concept of friends, you know, perhaps 10 or 20 years ago, if you had 20 good friends, Friends that you can rely upon to be there whenever you needed them. Always be there. They've got your back any time you needed them. You were well off. You, you were in a great position if you had 20 devoted friends. In fact, you were probably better off than the majority of people. If you had five good friends that were always there for you, you were set. But nowadays, Imagine if you sign on to your Facebook account and you're looking through pro people's profiles, sometimes creepily. You know, it's not stalking if, if they're giving out all the information, right? 
and you're looking through people's profiles and you notice that one of your friends or someone has only 5 or 20 friends on their account. What kind of idea do you get about this person? A person who only has 20 friends on Facebook. You'll probably be thinking, you know, the poor, poor guy, poor girl, there's something wrong with them. They're not loved. No one pays any attention to them. You know, this is, this is really sad. Nowadays, if I want to feel accomplished, I have to make sure that I have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of Facebook friends. And they're all my friends, by the way. I don't know half of them. 50% of them I've never seen in real life. I don't know them, but they're my friends. And I feel accomplished because I have such a large following. I have such a large social network. And this is the case with uh, many people, unfortunately, even if these people, and if we see a person who has a lot of followers, we say, wow, this person is, is accomplished. This person has so many people that look up to him or her. He or she has connections. You know, they're not, they know what they're doing. We begin to envy such a person, even if that person has done absolutely nothing for the betterment of humanity. Absolutely nothing. But because this person has thousands or hundreds of friends on Facebook, this person becomes someone to envy, someone to look up to. The case of profile pictures, right? You know, many of us, those who go to the Middle East, many different countries in the Middle East, we go around, you know, on a trip, we come back and we scoff at the presidents and the leaders and the po politicians and the officials who have their pictures everywhere in the streets and the alleyways on buses on you know everywhere on buildings we come back and we say look at this person's got a problem he or she but in most cases he he has his picture everywhere the picture is everywhere you go into any street any alleyway there's buildings bridges everywhere everywhere the picture of this president or this picture of this leader is there. You know, they have a problem. What's wrong with them? But we forget that when we sign on to our Facebook accounts, if we go to our profile pictures, which are constantly updated, and we're constantly posting new pictures all the time, you know, everyone seems to be a model on Facebook. Because every day it's a new thing. One day, it's, you know, a pose at the beach, the other day it's a pose in your car, the third day it's at your friend's house, the fourth day it's eating, the fifth day it's just the plate, not you eating, with food in there. Every day it's something different. One day it's your left side, the other day it's your right side, and my personal favorite is when it's, you know, completely cut in half, either the top or the bottom. And we have maybe tens of these. Sometimes some people have hundreds of profile pictures. Every day is something new. We scoff at dictators and leaders who have their pictures everywhere, but we forget about ourselves, where every day is a new picture. I mean, isn't the issue and the objective behind Facebook and social networking to communicate with one another? Communicating with one another doesn't require hundreds, you know, or, or tens or hundreds of pictures to be posted. For us to constantly be updating our profile pictures. And unfortunately, sometimes some of them are obscene pictures. The pictures that are put, you know, online. Or the things that we say in social networking. It's as if ghiba only exists in real life. When you're face to face, when you're talking, that's only when there's ghiba, there's backbiting. Over the computer, when you're texting it or typing it, it's not considered ghiba. And that's not the case. Or some of the words and the way that we speak online. I've noticed a lot of people, unfortunately, the way that they speak, even with friends with one another, put, you know, put aside the arguments and the heated arguments and the fights that people have online where they're just cursing one another back and forth. But even with friends, you know, using the F-bomb and the B-bomb and all of the other different bombs, just casually between one another. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to be completely critical. I live here too, also in the 21st century. I don't live in a different 
you know, place at a different time. And I also take advantage of social networking. What I want to suggest is that culture and technology are not inherently neutral. They're not inherently neutral. When we look and examine culture and when we examine technology and every aspect of society, we have to examine it with a critical eye. We cannot just, in the name of integration and assimilation, and just because everyone else is doing it, to accept everything wholeheartedly so that we can just be like everyone else. Not everything that is mainstream is right. In fact, there's a hadith that is attributed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad in which he says that Islam began as a strange religion, as an, a strange kind of ideology, and that it will end in a strange fashion. And good tidings or good news to those who are strange or those who are strangers. What does this mean? Does this mean that as Muslims we should go out and live our lives in a strange manner? You know, our friends are sitting, they're eating, they're using utensils and we should use our hands. Or that we should go to our business meetings and school and you know, everywhere else in traditional garb, robes and turbans and you know, these things. Or that we should be riding camels and horses instead of cars? No. Obviously, this is not the meaning of the hadith. What the hadith is referring to is that not everything that is mainstream is correct, is right. Sometimes it's those things that are considered strange that are the way to go. You know, the hadith, they tell us that Prophet Nuh السلام, Noah when he was building the ark, he was building this huge ship a thousand miles away from body, from you know, the water, any body of water, a thousand miles away. And when people would pass by, they thought this guy was crazy. They called him crazy. You're crazy, what's wrong with you? You're building a huge ship in the middle of nowhere. There's no water around. What are you doing? And it took him a very long time to build the ship. And they laughed at him, and they humiliated him, and they called him, you know, a stranger, a weirdo. But in the end, we know that this stranger was the one who had the last love. Sometimes, not everything that is mainstream, brothers and sisters, is correct. We have to keep this in mind. This is very important for us. We have to look at everything and examine everything with a critical eye. And we have to turn to others. You know, sometimes we critique those Muslims who live in different parts of the world for, and we call them naive because they've been taken advantage of and they've become extremists. And as a result, they're taken advantage of by you know certain individuals or groups that want to destroy the image of Islam and this is why they do the things they do and we do so rightfully yes because some of them are truly naive because some of them are truly ignorant and this is why they are taken advantage of by anti-Islamic forces and under the name of Islam under the name of God but they're completely anti-Islamic but some but we forget about our extreme also Sometimes we also become extremists. I'm not talking about suicide bombers and I'm not talking about fundamentals. I'm talking about being taken advantage of by society, by culture, by the norms, by values, by you know the system. Sometimes some of us are taken completely advantage of. We're under complete control. We've become desensitized to the plight of others to the needs and the concerns of others around us. We've become desensitized. Turn on the TV, we watch the news. You know, there's a bombing here. This many people have been killed. This many people raped. This many people shot. This many people destroyed. 
you know, this disaster, hurricane is taking the lives of this number of people, and so on and so forth. And even locally, not just in different parts of the world, even those around us. And we've become desensitized. We watch this, you know, we might even say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi wa jahoon, kind of feel a little sad about it, and then that's pretty much it. That's basically it. We've become desensitized. And the reason is because we notice that some of the values, some of the, the ways and the mediums of the culture that, and the society that we live in have encouraged us to become desensitized. Look at the video games and the movies that we watch. The video games and the movies, the video games that you know, we play, and the movies that we watch. Most of them, most of them, the most popular, especially video games, the most popular are what? Not sports, no. Shooting. Shoot them up games. Look at the most popular, the most sold, and the most bought. Probably the first three or four are, are games of, of violence and action. And then, you know, come football games and, you know, sports games. Even those games which are rated, you know, uh, everyone, E for everyone, or games that are rated for the, you know, younger children, for instance, they have some aspect of violence, some aspect of, you know, hurting someone, breaking someone's neck for a few coins or points or whatever it may be. And the same goes for movies. Movies become box office hits when there's two factors, one or both of these involved. One is violence, action, because we love seeing people chase people, we love car chases, we love violence, we love watching people kill each other, destroy each other, blow things up, or promiscuity. Otherwise, most people don't go and watch the film. It becomes a box office hit when one of these themes is involved and it's recurring. We've become desensitized, and it's very unfortunate, brothers and sisters. If we believe that Islam has come as a whole for all times and for all places, for everyone's safety, then we have to understand that the safety and the security and the prosperity of society comes before our own individual safety and security. We have to be able to turn to others and to have concern for others. One of the hallmarks, one of the most important parts of our belief system, especially as followers of the school of Ahlul Bayt is that we believe in the coming, the reappearance of the final Imam, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. We believe that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will allow this Imam to return, to reappear, in order to fill the earth with justice, with equality, with goodness, after it has been filled with inequality, with oppression, with injustice. But brothers and sisters, we have to ask ourselves a question, and that is, who or what is the Imam returning for? Because the Ahadith, they tell us that the Imam Yes, he comes by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he spreads Islam. But that the Imam himself, although he's an Imam, he will have helpers, he will have followers, he will have companions who will aid him in spreading justice and equality and goodness. The Imam's not going to be doing it by himself. He has followers, he has aid. He has those who will help him in doing so. And we have to ask ourselves, are we ready? When we consider ourselves as followers of the Ahlul Bayt and as followers of the Imam, am I ready? If the Imam were to appear tomorrow and he were to examine his followers and he would want to see who would help him in this noble mission of spreading justice and he looks at me and he says, Hadi, let me examine him. Let me see whether this person is suitable to be you know, part of my society, part of those companions who will help bring justice to society. 
Am I ready? I ask myself this question. Am I ready? Do I have concern for others or is it just about me? Is it just about taking care of myself before taking care of others? And each and every one of us can ask this question. The Holy Quran tells us, إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. Allah does not change the condition of a nation or a society, a community, until they are ready to change their own condition, until they take the necessary steps to take to change their own condition. Otherwise, Allah does not force a community to change. It doesn't make sense for Allah to change or force a community to change. We have to be ready to sacrifice brothers and sisters. And we have to be ready to sacrifice for others. The Quran tells us, Len, you will never. The Quran does not say la, not. Len is 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 it's eternal, it's long, a negation. It's an eternal negation, it's it's absolute. You will never attain success, righteousness, unless you are ready to sacrifice from that which you love. Not just sacrifice anything. Sometimes, you know, we see a poor person on the street and we feel bad for this person and we say, you know what, let me help him or her out. And we dig into our pockets and we look for, you know, the, the smaller amounts of change. And even when it comes to those pennies, we kind of, we give up off those, you know, the older pennies, the newer, shinier ones, you know, I want to keep for myself. The Quran says, that which you love, when you give and you sacrifice that which you love, that which is dear to you, that's when you will attain righteousness. When we look at Imam Hussain and his revolution, this revolution that for centuries, for centuries and centuries, we remember this. We remember this great act of sacrifice that Imam Hussain he performed him and his family and his companions, men and women. We remember it for centuries. Reports tell us that over 20 million followers, adherents of Imam Hussein, walking and going towards Karbala, just this Arba'i. People who are in love, some of them walking for two weeks straight. Men, women, children. We remember every year, we remember this great sacrifice. And one of the most important objectives of this sacrifice, of this tragedy, was that Imam Hussein and his companions and family members, they were ready to sacrifice. They were ready to give. And they gave that which they loved. They gave that which they loved. Look at Abbas alayhis Abbas alayhis salam, you know, sometimes if we don't have something to drink for a few hours, you know, during the month of Ramadan, for instance, if we haven't had something to drink just for a few hours, we notice how thirsty we feel. That's the first thing. People don't get hungry. They feel very thirsty though. Just, but it's only a few hours. Al Abbas alayhi salam for three consecutive days he did not have any water. Not a single drop of water. Imagine what kind of thirst he was feeling. In a desert, under the heat of the desert, the scorching heat. But when he arrives to the river bank and he enters and he feels the water. Imagine brothers and sisters, after three days what kind of feeling you'd have when you, you feel like you're dying of thirst. There's, there's no more moisture in your body anymore. Yet, during this vital moment, he remembers. He remembers. He says, I'm not going to drink a single drop of water because my beloved brother, Imam Hussein, is thirsty. Because the Sayyidah Zainab and the woman and the children and Sukaina is thirsty. How can I drink water? When they are thirsty, he sacrifices that which he loves. And this is why he becomes Al-Abbas. This is why the rest of the companions, because they sacrificed their, their lives, that which they hold dearly. They sacrificed it 
for others, for you and me, brothers and sisters. For us to be able to proudly stand and say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, wa Ashhadu anna Ali Muhammad. For us to be able to be proud of this faith and this religion, they sacrifice. I have to ask myself, what am I ready to sacrifice? What am I ready to sacrifice for others? What am I ready to sacrifice for Allah? What am I ready to sacrifice for my family and for my brothers and sisters in faith, for those around me? What am I ready to sacrifice for all of humanity? Sayyidah Zainab salam, she sacrifices her honor, her dignity. She sacrifices it. And she is well aware, she knows. She knows that after Imam Hussein is killed, what's going to happen to them? They're aware, the women, they are aware of this. All of them are killed one by one. They're all killed. After they are killed on the day of Ashura, Umar ibn Sa'd, he commands his army. He commands his army to burn the tents where the women and the children were housed. And then to hold the women, to hold an Imam Zayn al Abidin, to hold the children as captives. They are taken as captives and they are dragged. They are dragged across the land of Karbala, where they see the bodies of their family members, where they see the bodies of the companions, where they, where they see the bodies of the Ahlul Bayt, as Sayyidah Zainab as she's being dragged in chains, she's taken captive, she passes by the body of her brother, Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, she sees the body of her brother, she begins to weep, she, she begins to mourn, she turns towards the city of Medina where her grandfather, the Holy Prophet, is buried and she begins to mourn. She says, Ya Muhammadah, O oh Prophet, Ya Muhammadah, Salla alayka malaika tu sama, Hada Husaynun murammanun bidima. This is Hussein, this is your grandson who is drenched in his own blood. This is Hussein who has been killed by the opponents, Masloob al Imamati wa Rida. Not only did they behead him, they trampled his body and they even stole his clothing. They stripped his body of his turban and his robe. Unfortunately, she begins to mourn, she weeps and she cries. For her, for her brother Abi Abdullah al Hussein, she is taken along with the women and children. They are taken along with the heads of the companions. Umar ibn Sa'd he commands his army to behead all of the martyrs. All of their, their heads are placed on the spears and they are marched towards the city of Kufa. There they are taken to the palace of Ibn Ziyad where the, command, the, the governor of Kufa, as they are taken there, they are taken to the court of Ibn Ziyad. The people, some of the people, they see them and they begin to weep. They cry, as Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. She turns to them, she tells them, why are you crying? What is the reason that you are crying? You did not come, she, she gives a very powerful statement. She says that you did not come to the assistance of the grandson of the Holy Prophet. What is, the, what is your excuse? What is the reason that you weep and cry now? And then an Imam Zayn al Abidin he stands up and he tells the people, he says, some of you probably don't recognize us. You don't know who we are. We are the family. We are the Ahlul Bayt. We are the family of the Holy Prophet. And some of you betrayed us. How will you answer the Holy Prophet? How will you answer my grandfather Amir al muminin and my grandmother Fatima al Zahra on the Day of Judgment when they ask you, why did you not go and assist our son Hussein? Allahu Akbar Ibn Ziyad, as he's sitting, he commands the head for the head of Imam Hussein to be brought forth before him. 
he takes his cane and he begins to strike the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and then he takes his cane and he strikes the lips of Imam Hussein Allahu Akbar one of the companions who lived during the time of the Holy Prophet Zayd ibn Arqam he was there he was present he was an old man he tells him oh governor of Kufa what are you doing do you not know that these lips when Hussein was an infant, these lips, Rasulullah, he himself would kiss these lips. How dare you strike the head and the lips of this, of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, Allahu Akbar. And then he turns to Zainab alayhi salam ibn Ziyad and he tells her, he says, How do you see that which God has done to you? God has humiliated you, He has killed your family members, He has stopped you from doing what you wanted to do. How do you see this? How do you experience this? Zainab alayhi salam, she turns and she says, Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. I do not see anything but beauty because this is the will of Allah. Imam Hussein died, he sacrificed himself for the sake of Allah. We did all of this for the sake of God and this is why it is beautiful. The heads then, they are taken along with the captives towards the city of Damascus towards the court of Yazid on the way, they stop a few places to rest. They stop and the heads, they are displayed on the spears for the people to see. At one of the locations they stop is the home of a Christian monk, a Christian a priest. He sees them and he asks them, he says, who are these people? They say, these people, they try to you know, change the story. They tell him these people, they're foreigners, they're strangers. He begins to ask time and time again until they tell him, they tell him that these people are the family of the Prophet. He points to the head of Imam Hussein. He says, who is this? He says, this is the grandson of the Prophet, the Christian. He turns to, to them, to the soldiers. He says, this is the grandson of your Prophet. This is the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the son of Fatima to Zahra. They say yes. And he says, who did this to them? They say, we did this to them. And then he says, oh, why is it that you did this? Had Jesus, had Jesus had a son of his own, we would have held him in high esteem and value. And then he turned to the soldiers. He told them, since you are resting here for the night, I just have one request. Please allow me to keep this head with me tonight. I am ready to give you any amount of money that you want. And so they allow him. He takes the head home. He takes the head of Imam Hussein home. He washes the head. He cleans the head. He begins to kiss the head and he weeps and he cries over the head of Imam Hussein. And there he sits and he begins to speak to the head of Imam Hussein. He tells him, because you are the grandson of the Prophet, they have done all of these things to you, I have realized, and because of this, I want to accept Islam. السلام عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخرا عهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي جميعا ثواب سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات